nous avons ouvert le débat sur la neutralité du net ce matin. Euh, nous allons le poursuivre avec un aperçu des solutions sur, euh, sur la question de la neutralité du net euh, par une succession de keynotes, présentations. Euh, on va commencer avec euh, John Palfrey, qui est professeur de droit à Harvard, euh, qui concentre ses recherches sur euh, les lois Internet, la propriété intellectuelle et euh, le potentiel des nouvelles technologies pour euh, renforcer euh, les démocraties dans le monde. Euh, ce sera une discussion avec euh, Jérémy Zimmerman. Je vous invite tous les deux à, à venir sur scène. Euh, Jérémy qui est cofondateur de La Quadrature du Net. Bienvenue. Um, hello, hello John. It's hello Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Have you here? Um, we discussed briefly tomorrow, uh, to the, this morning, about um, net neutrality and the, the importance of the issue to um, to ensure that the internet will remain free because uh, free software, free and open source software, depend on a free internet. The question of net neutrality is basically: uh, Will we allow operators? to restrict our internet access and uh, transform the internet into what was AOL or what was the, the Minitel in France. Uh, and how can we um, forbid them from such behaviors when they have an economic incentive to do so? Um, you've been working on the issue in the US, I think, for the last seven years or something, because the, the issue has been debated in the open in the US much before here in the EU. So um, it will be very precious. Uh, maybe my first question will be, what is your perspective on net neutrality in general as an issue? Jeremy, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, to have this conversation uh, about this topic. I, my general perspective on this topic is that it should be as important to this conversation as the big terms like open source and interoperability and standardization that we've heard over the course of the day. I have heard you know, presentations from open source developers but also from Microsoft and others saying how important this layer of the internet is and the ability to do this development. And I actually think that the network neutrality debate is one of the fundamental building blocks on which we can have things like open source um, software and interoperability and standardization. And I think one of the ways in which to see this is really at the level of a principle. It's a principle about how the network is going to operate and what can be allowed to be done on top of it. So why I think it's important is, uh, to borrow a term of a colleague of mine, Jonathan Zittrin, is to think about the network as generative, to think about the network as something on which you can do more. And I think at any point in the system where we can um, reduce the restrictions, the proprietary controls over what can be done in those areas, we're going to see innovation on top of that layer of the network. So um, I think that consistently, if we see network neutrality as a principle, a core network principle, something that of course allows for some exceptions, reasonable network management, we can get into that if you like, um, but we see this as a bedrock of what we want the network to be, not just in the United States, but in a global way, that that will lead to the greatest economic growth through innovation. Um, I think that it boils down to uh, the universality of the internet, and I think that this is this property of the network that makes it so special that whether you're in Canada or in Ghana or in Guatemala, you have access to the very same internet. And I think this is what we need to, to protect here. So everybody here and maybe beyond uh, we will agree on the principle. The question today is how do we enforce this principle when operators are more and more concentrating, their interests are more and more merging with media companies, and as the telecom operators become more and more powerful, what can we do uh, as citizens, as um, political zone, uh, as, as, a, as a parliament, uh, what can we do to enforce that principle? So, we have the situation here in the EU with Nelly Cruz saying, oh, there's no problem, let's do nothing. 
Um, we'll hear uh, Daphne van der Koft uh, from the Netherlands will tell us how Bits of Freedom um, did a wonderful job to have a legislation adopted in the Netherlands. Well, it is currently being adopted. Uh, we'll, we'll see Laure de la Rodière, the, the French uh, MP, uh, explaining how she's working on having such a law adopted. What is the situation in the US? We heard of the, the non-legislative approach of the FCC. So how did it came? To, to what it is today, and please describe what it is today. It's a wonderful question with many layers to it, and I will get to the US, but I want to hit a few things that you got to along the way. I think one of the big questions about the global internet is whether or not it will stay a global internet. So I'm not positive that the basic idea of network neutrality is accepted at all, broadly. Um, I also think that as we see more and more states putting filtering regimes in on the internet. We've been studying this for the last decade. Um, in 2002, there were two states that practiced uh, internet filtering in China um, and Saudi Arabia. There are now 36 or more states that filter the internet. So I think there are blockages and controls over the network that are emerging. And I don't think we do really have a world wide web at the moment. I think we have um, a series of different webs that are connected as a network in some respects, but not entirely. So I don't think even at that level of principle, we do have agreement. Um, I think that the idea of network neutrality um, is one that most people could agree on some flavor of it, um, but I think once you get down to what exactly it ought to mean and how we ought to put it in place, that's where things get sticky. So I want to put a strong uh, statement forward, which is I think a strong form, a meaningful form of network neutrality is very important as a bedrock piece in developing a networked uh, economic structure in any given state, and that that should be true across other, you know, across networks as well. Um, so where things stand in the United States, it's a complicated picture. As you noted, it's been a very hot debate for six or seven years now. Uh, mostly in uh, the context of Washington, D.C. And the particular situation is that we have, uh, at this moment, a president, Barack Obama, who campaigned, saying network neutrality was important. He had the support of a lot of people who would be from our community, in essence, who um, support this kind of an idea, and he came out very strongly in favor of it. Um, and then you have a, a Congress which has been relatively hostile to this idea. It almost directly is along partisan lines. So by and large, Republicans dislike network neutrality. By and large, Democrats like network neutrality. It's not precisely that way, but most of the reactions you see will break down along those lines. Um, and then the relevant agency is the Federal Communications Commission. Now, in the United States, that's an independent agency. The president doesn't boss that agency around, um, and the Congress can kind of try to override what the FCC does, but it is itself independent as a regulator. Um, where things stand is after many years of debate, uh, the, uh, the president had said he favored strong net neutrality legislation. The new chair, Julius Janikowski of the FCC, proposed a series of network neutrality rules last December. La Quadratio du Net wrote a very nice analysis of it on your website, which I commend uh, to everybody. The, um, the uh, the approach that Chairman Janikowski took was a pretty watered-down approach to network neutrality. It had some principles in there, so it was a positive step forward in a sense, as you guys noted, um, but it was one that had lots and lots of holes to it and one that I think um, the uh, industry service providers were happier with, say, than the activists on the public interest side, um, somebody like me. So um, some of the limitations, just to be clear, one was it exempted mobile uh, in lots of ways. So um, if you think about the fact that more people in 2012 or 2013 will access the web through mobile networks than through a fixed line you know, on their computer at their desk, you know, the value of doing something in this kind of limited way is, is lower. There are exceptions uh, along the way for certain kinds of content. Um, I think there will be restrictions plainly on the use of uh, applications like peer-to-peer -peer and so forth as a result. Um, there are many, many other reasons why these rules, I think, though a step forward, weren't um, as far as many people had hoped. Um, but even these rules themselves are uh, under some attack. So the um, House of Representatives has passed a, um, the, some legislation uh, that would undercut these rules. There are legal questions about whether or not even these rules are things that the FCC can do. So as of right now, I think there's a very murky picture for real net neutrality in the United States. Um, yet at a principal level, it's very important, I think, that we pursue it. Okay, so that was the, um, the dark side, so to say, of the, of the issue. Um, well, we're... Well, I'm an activist, so I'm a bit of an idealist. Uh, let's project ourselves for, for a moment in our ideal world. Um, what would be in your ideal world uh, enforceable guidelines? And uh, would they have to come uh, through legislation? Could they be on the regulatory uh, level? Or could they be just market-driven, contract-based um, 
uh, provisions. How would you define a perfect world of net neutrality? I actually think it could come through either of those two means. I'm a believer that every once in a while the market is going to end up providing things that the government is too slow to provide in the United States. So I think it's entirely plausible that you get some competition along these particular lines and I think that would, um, that would be an unstable way to get there in the sense that there would be no certainty that they would stick. But I could imagine service providers in fact competing on the basis of this openness. That would be a great scenario if it were to pass and I I hope that there are examples in Europe where that might actually be happening here too. Um, I don't see that in the near term in the US, but I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, there is the possibility of uh, passing legislation. I think that's unlikely anytime soon in the United States, just given the nature of the current Congress, um, the, given the sort of bent towards uh, restricting the FCC's ability to do this. So I don't put a lot of weight on that. Um, I do think there's a form of regulation that the FCC could do, which would really put this in the, um, in the uh, zone of saying, uh, as a first principle, we believe in network neutrality. And then we say there are reasons why uh, people can take certain packets and pass them uh, at different rates. So one would be reasonable network management for reasons that engineers, maybe an external group would say, for engineering reasons we need to allow this. Um, there are lots of examples for why you need to manage the network to some extent from an engineering perspective, so long as you're not doing it for anti-competitive purposes. Second, I imagine we'll get to this later, but the idea of managed services um, as a way to uh, uh, have a different layer of services on top of the net. Um, so I think you could have the principle of network neutrality and have some reasonable ways to carve it out that would in fact be effective for this key purpose we were talking about earlier, which is ensuring that innovation, consumer choice, and these kind of democratic ends uh, are met through the network. Inspiring. Um, Mike, maybe, maybe it's, it will be um, a last question, so we'll save time for an open discussion with all the, the, the participants Great. later on. And actually, maybe this question should be aimed towards all the, 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 the speakers as well. And in a way, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a trap because I will ask you to do a bit of what should be my job. But Thanks for letting me know it's a trap, that's yeah. helpful. So yeah, be, be, be aware. Um, what could we do and how could we do it to make this issue really global? I mean, th there is, uh, Free Press has been doing a wonderful job in the US, uh, bits of freedom uh, in the Netherlands, we've been trying on the EU level and in France and, and so on. But this is a global issue for a global internet. And uh, looking prospectively at things, we see, uh, we see global issues arising with, uh, uh, with finance, uh, with the economic crisis, with energy, with environment, and so on. And one may think, as an idealist, that we may only address those global issues with this global tool that is the global free neutral internet. So what would be the, 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 the narratives, what would be the, the tools, what would be the means to try to make this issue as important as it should be? So next year, an open world forum or any other such gathering will say, yeah, free software, interoperability, <laughs> net neutrality, and so on. Huh? Do you have it's a great and huge question. My answer is La Quatuture du Net, free press, bits of freedom. You have, in a sense, the, uh, the infrastructure, the human infrastructure to do this. You've got the best network to do it on. You uh, blog and tweet and uh, raise it. And I think you have events like Open World Forum promoting this as a, as a central concept. I think it really is an issue that can join democratic activists, people who care about freedom and liberty and so forth, with people who seek economic growth, as many people do here, along with people who care about education. All the things that happen on this network, I think it can be a global issue in that way, and it should be. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.